Tango Gameworks has proved that the studio is more than capable of crafting an open world action game with Ghostwire Tokyo. Above everything it brings to the table, the game is a nice approach to the traditional sandbox recipe by merging a stunning city with an intense combat system that relies on super cool powers and abilities. During some parts of Ghostwire Tokyo, I felt like an assassin as I crept around corners stabbing visitors in the back, and at other times I felt like a badass superhero as I soared across the rooftops and performed insane over-the-top elemental attacks that devastated my foes. In a way, Ghostwire Tokyo is unlike anything I've ever played before. Sure, its sandbox open world approach isn't anything original, but the way Tango Gameworks has built this game makes it exciting even during some of the dullest of chapters. Tokyo has been attacked by a strange fog and 99% of the population has vanished. All they have left behind are their clothes and personal items. Is this the rapture? Well, kind of. Game creator Shinji Mikamo has envisioned his own end of the world in Ghostwire Tokyo, whereas Tokyo is now a wasteland where ghosts, called visitors, roam the streets, spirits with unfinished business need help, and there are lots of cats. No really, the cats are everywhere, and they are pretty happy with the fact that everybody is up and vanished. A man with a scary looking Hanya mask named, well, Hanya, is believed to be behind all the people vanishing in Tokyo, and now Akito, who is a general run of the mill civilian, gets possessed by a badass spirit called KK. Thanks to this possession, Akito can now wield ungodly powers and do all sorts of cool things. Without KK, Akito is pretty much useless. The game makes this quite clear during certain portions of the gameplay. Ghostwire Tokyo revolves around a special power called Ether. This Ether makes it possible for Akito to perform his attacks. Ether is also linked to the other side, granting him the ability to see spirits, save them, protect them, and more. I won't spoil the story in Ghostwire Tokyo, but the game's heavy emphasis on supernatural, Japanese yokai, and the city itself is layered in depth. The way the whole thing is uncovered is pretty great too. There's also a huge emotional aspect behind everything happening in Ghostwire Tokyo. The side quests range from heartbreaking stories about death, to deep and meaningful lessons about the way humans treat each other and themselves. Of course, this is all delivered in a dark and uncomfortable spiritual theme that makes Ghostwire Tokyo's stories feel incredibly sad. The game is also as Japanese as it comes. The city is sprawling with secrets to find that all tie back to Japanese folklore, be it yokai to find hidden around the world, collectibles to discover around every corner, and even various stores that sell Japanese food that buffs Akito's attacks and refills his health. I spent the majority of my time in Ghostwire Tokyo exploring, as open world games go, and Tokyo is gorgeous. Every street is filled with bikes, little cars, and intricate little details that help bring the world to life. The world makes the experience feel authentic while also acting as a great escape to Tokyo. Even though the weather is horrible and it mostly rains all the time, the city comes alive thanks to its puddles of water that reflect the bright neon signs around the city. Even the most boring of locations like the Shibuya Station is highly detailed in signage, shops and more. <laughs> Best of all, the city of Tokyo feels airy. Everyone has vanished and Akito and KK are the only two people walking the streets. Well, one technically. While exploring, I really felt alone, with only the sounds of my own footsteps walking through the wet streets and the sounds of yokai in the distance keeping me company. Sure, KK is always around, but in terms of other people, Akito is a lone soldier and the game's ambience hits this nail on the head. <laughs> Speaking of KK and Akito, the two are a fantastic pair in Ghostwire Tokyo. While they start off a bit rough, their relationship starts to grow and the experience is carried out thanks to this non-stop banter. In a way, you play Ghostwire Tokyo as two characters in one person, and they both successfully bring their own unique personality to the game wherever possible. <laughs> While the game takes a while to set itself up, once I was going, Ghostwire Tokyo is a sandbox open world through and through. Ikito is limited to exploring areas cleared of the deadly fog. This means I had to cleanse shrines across the city to clear the fog and discover more of the map. Once discovered, the map showed off new stores to purchase items from, sidewalks to take quests from, and of course, I could actually walk through the part of the city without dying in the fog instantly.
The shrines act as glorified watchtowers in a sense, but they also help the game progress at a steady pace. For example, during some parts of the game, there were no shrines to cleanse, but I still had map to discover. This limited me to certain parts of the city without even knowing it. In later chapters, more map was unlocked by more shrines I could find, and these areas held tougher enemies and more things to do. I get why Tango Gameworks approached the game in this way. Ghostwire Tokyo was meant to be a narrative-driven game, and by holding my hand through where I went, it helped push the story and I enjoyed it more. The fact that I could not go and discover the entire map at the start also helped feed into the game's incredible sense of discovery. The more I played, the more story I enjoyed, and the more I realized just how massive the map was. Combat in Ghostwire Tokyo is a huge portion of the experience too. Akito, thanks to KK's ether ability, allows him to cast magic attacks. Well, they aren't technically magic, but they are kind of at the same time. These attacks range from fire, air, and water, and Akito can expand these later on with limited talismans that hold even more abilities like shock and even vines that spawn that he can hide behind. <laughs> These ether attacks are limited to the number of ether Akito has, but this can be expanded by finding shrines throughout the city. However, each element also has its own cool attack style that is tailored for a specific combat approach. Water, for example, can be charged to send out a large shockwave blade that hits enemies in front of me. This was limited in range, but powerful. Air acts as the primary attack and I mostly always had ether to cast it. This attack revolved around single fire blade shots with far range. It could also be charged for a flurry of powerful shots. There's also fire that shoots arrow-like balls at enemies. It can be charged for a massive ball of fire that exploded in a radius of damage. All abilities can also be upgraded using skill points earned through exploration, saving souls and depositing them into a telephone. I know, it's random, but it makes sense later in the game. You can also purchase skill points. Skills get stronger, are faster to charge, and combat goes from being awesome to flipping amazing after a while. Of course, enemies, also called visitors, get tougher after a while and start to spawn in larger masses. Akito can time a perfect parry to shoot back ether at a visitor while also combining a bow and arrow shot with all the other ether abilities to decimate these ghosts. The game really shines during these late game combat encounters with the massive enemies Akito's powerful attacks and KK cheering him on. At the same time, combat isn't easy. I had to be careful what was attacking me, where I was parrying, what I was attacking back with, and how my ether charges were holding up. Some encounters had me without any ammo, meaning I had to run around the world punching objects to refill it. Akito also gets bracelets that buff certain attack styles, meaning you could build him into specific attack preferences if you wanted to. Enemies are also intimidating, as Japanese yokai usually are. They fly around above, attack on the ground, and each has been designed to attack and defend in a certain way. I had to always constantly adapt to my opponent and even the environment around me. My biggest issue with Ghostwire Tokyo is probably its sandbox design. While Tokyo is gorgeous, outside of the main and sub-missions, the world does start to blend into itself after a while. The game relies heavily on exploration, especially exploring for spirits to save, shrines to cleanse and Jesus statues to check off your list. However, after a dozen or so hours, this becomes a bit mindless. Much of the most important things to find aren't easily discovered, meaning I had to really look hard to find it all. Sure, I could feed a dog who would often take me to a collectible, but this wasn't always guaranteed. It does get easier to explore thanks to Akito's ability to glide through the air. I could then grapple to a Tengu at the top of a building and soar from the rooftop to rooftop, but even that becomes a chore after a while. 
I think the big issue here is the 240,000 souls that need to be saved, meaning I had to find each and every bundle floating through the air and absorb them. Some of them also had a seal on them which I had to mimic a gesture to release it first. It was fun the first hundred times I did it, but after a while it was a snooze fest. Exploration is also vital to powering up a Keto and KK, so I felt compelled I had to do it all the time no matter how tedious it got. Completionists will love the world, but after playing excellent open world games like Horizon Forbidden West and Elden Ring, Ghostwire Tokyo's approach to its open world and exploration just feels a bit dated and slow. Don't get me wrong, it doesn't make a bad game, but you'll enjoy the missions a lot more than the exploration. And that's my thoughts on Ghostwire Tokyo. Are you picking the game up? Let us know in the comments down below. As always, please do like and subscribe and visit www.glitchthonline for all your gaming, tech and pop culture news. Until next time, farewell.